Hey everyone, welcome to the first part of our Unity tutorial series on creating a bike controller. In this first part, we'll focus on getting our bike to move and turn smoothly. We'll be refining and adding more features in the upcoming videos. Let's start. Our approach for this controller is to use a sphere with a rigid body component. The player's input will control the sphere's movement and the bike's body will follow it, creating the illusion that the player is in control of the bike. But in reality, we'll be handling the sphere's movements. Now let's dive into the Unity specifics. Start by creating an empty game object and name it Bike. Then add a 3D sphere object to it, which will represent our bike. Now attach a new script to the bike and name it Bike Controller. Next, for the bike model, you can use any model of your choice. If you don't have one, I have provided a bike model in description. And if you want to use yours, then make sure the bike's body, both the tires and the handle, should be separate mesh and handle's center should be at the turning point and others at their respective center of mass. With everything set up, let's jump into the coding part. First and foremost, create some important variables. Move input to control the forward and backward movement of our bike. Max speed for maximum speed. Acceleration to control the rate of change of velocity. And create a reference to our sphere rigid body with the variable sphere RB. In update methods, set the move input to input dot get axis vertical and set the bike's position to sphere RB's position. This is essential to move the bike with the sphere. Otherwise, the bike will remain stationary. Now, to move our bike forward and backward, we'll create a function called movement and call it in fixed update as we are going to handle physics in this function. In this function, we'll use lerp to adjust the velocity of sphere RB. We'll transition from whatever the current velocity of sphere RB to the maximum velocity, multiplied by the move input value, and further multiplied by transform.forward. The interpolation value will be time.fixed delta time, multiplied by the acceleration. So, to understand this, you first need to know how vector3.lerp works. We use lerp when we want to transition from one value to another. Here, A is the starting value, B is the end value, and T is the value used to interpolate between A and B. Vector3.lerp returns A plus B minus A multiplied by T. Here T is clamped to the range from 0 to 1. To understand this better, let the value of A equals 0 and B equals 100. Now, when T equals 0, Vector3.lerp returns 0. When T equals 0 0.5, we get 50. And when T equals 1, we get the end value that is 100. Similarly, we can make our bike's velocity go from zero to max velocity. However, the issue with this transition is that this is not smooth but linear, and we want the velocity of our bike to increase smoothly. To do this, we'll set the current velocity as the starting value, end value as max velocity, and t as time dot delta time. Time dot delta time is the interval in seconds from the last frame to the current one, which is mostly constant, but you may say, t was not constant in our previous example, and it needs to be a variable to help us transition. But in our approach, starting value that is current velocity is variable, which will help us transition. Assume we're transitioning from zero velocity to a maximum of 100, and t is set to 0.1. Then, here's what happens. In the first frame, when a is zero, the formula returns 10, which makes our current velocity 10. In the next frame, A is now 10, B is still 100, and T remains 0.1. Therefore, the formula returns 19. This process continues, and you can see that the velocity changes gradually, reaching the maximum value of 100. This approach effectively controls acceleration and ensures that the bike's velocity increases smoothly up to the maximum as the player provides input. To control the bike with our input, we'll multiply max velocity with move input. And to move the sphere in forward direction, we'll also multiply with transform.forward. And to control how fast the bike will get to its max velocity, we'll multiply time.fixedelta time with acceleration. Now assign the rigid body to the sphere RB and set all the variables needed. Now if we play the game, the bike just falls through the ground. 
This is because the center points of both the bike and the sphere RB are not at the same position. So, what's happening is sphere is falling down and bike's position is getting set to sphere RB and sphere RB is trying to get back to its primary position relative to bike as it's a child of bike and then bike again tries to get to sphere's position and this goes on and on until the point when both of them fall through the ground. To make the center point same, we'll take the sphere RB out of the bike's hierarchy. Then we'll copy the bike's position and paste it into the sphere's position. Now the centers are perfectly aligned. Finally, we'll drag the sphere RB back into the bike's hierarchy. Please note that while it appears that the sphere's position has changed, it's just displaying the relative position to the bike's position, also known as the local position. Adjust the bike body according to your needs. And now if you play the game, everything seems fine. Forward and backward, both are working. But we've one more issue left. The bike is jittering and the sphere RB's position keeps shifting from its original center. Let me explain why this is happening. When the sphere RB moves based on player input, the bike also moves to match the sphere RB's position. But when bike moves, it also causes the sphere RB to move along with the bike, since it's a child of the bike. This cycle continues, causing the sphere RB's position relative to the bike to keep on shifting. To fix this issue, let's return to the script. At the start, we'll set the parent of sphere RB to null. By doing this, sphere RB is no longer a child of the bike. As a result, when the bike moves to sphere RB's position, Sphere RB stays in its original position, unaffected by the bike's movement. Now everything is working great, which is fantastic. Now for the collisions, attach a box collider to the bike body and carefully shape it to match the bike's body. If we run the game now, the bike has stopped moving, but if you see from side angle, it's moving really slow. Here's what's happening. Currently, we have two colliders in the bike. The first is the collider attached to Sphere RB, and the other is the collider for the bike's body. Both of these colliders are overlapping, causing continuous collisions between them. To resolve this issue, we need to disable collisions between Sphere RB and the bike body's collider. In the Layers panel, create two layers, one for the bike's body and another for Sphere RB. Assign the respective layers to Sphere RB and the bike body. In the project settings, under physics, in the collider matrix, disable collision between the sphere RB layer and the bike body layer. Now, if we play, everything seems fine. However, you'll notice that the bike body's collider isn't colliding with anything. This is happening because when the bike body collides with an object, the sphere is still free to move and bike body is following the sphere's movement. Therefore, the collision is being overridden by this setup. To fix this issue, attach a rigid body component to the bike body. Add a fixed joint component to it and set sphere RB as the connected body. This will restrict the sphere from moving when bike body collides. If you play the game now, you'll notice that the bike body's rigid body is rotating randomly due to physics forces and collisions. We don't want that. To resolve this, go to the rigid body component and under constraints, freeze rotation in all directions. This should solve the problem. Finally, in the script, create a variable bike body to store the rigid body of bike and set the bike body's parent to null and rotate it with the bike. To do that, we need to use move rotation function as bike body is a rigid body. By this, it'll avoid any involuntary movements caused by the bike body's rigid body and also turn off the gravity for bike body because we don't need that as it's moving with the sphere RB. Now, as you can see, the bike body's collider is functioning properly. Let's proceed with coding the rotation of the bike. Create a variable steer input to handle the horizontal input. In the update, set it as input.getAxis, horizontal. Create a variable steer strength to control the amount by which you want the bike to turn. Now create a function rotation. We will rotate the bike in the y-axis to a rotation that equals steer input, multiplied by move input, further multiplied by steer strength, and finally by time dot fixed delta time. And this rotation is relative to world space, as we want the bike to rotate in global coordinates. 
to prevent the bike from rotating while stationary, we multiplied the rotation value by the move input, since the move input is zero in that case. And also don't forget to call rotation in fixed update. Now let's test this out. And as you can see, the bike is rotating as expected. That concludes this video. In the upcoming part, we'll work on making the bike tilt realistically as it turns and ensuring its alignment with the ground angle and much more. If you found this video helpful, consider giving it a like and subscribe to our channel. We have a lot more tutorials coming your way. If you have questions or suggestions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. For engaging discussions and the chance to influence our future video topics, join our Discord community. Link is in the description. That's a wrap for today and we'll catch you in the next part.